as I was as I was listening to Glenn sing Bob Dylan, and I was listening to Joy read from Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd's book, After the Good News, a connection appeared. It was the same year in 1964, or thereabouts, that the Unitarian Universalist published a hymnal without any confession. That Dylan wrote, Our Brain's Gonna Fall. Isn't that interesting? A breaking news story came across my screen a couple of months ago. The Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the nation's most revered and most important social justice organizations, was going through a massive leadership shakeup. Morris Dees, the founder and face of the Southern Poverty Law Center, had been fired. Richard Cohen, the organization's president, had resigned. The Southern Poverty Law Center did great work and does great work and will continue to do great work. It used the power of the law to hobble and break up white supremacist terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and the Aryan Nation. It monitors and educates about hate groups operating in the United States. It protects and defends the civil rights of marginalized communities. Such important work. I first learned about the Southern Poverty Law Center when its founder and chief counsel, Morris Dees, was the keynote lecturer at the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly 20 years ago. I was so inspired by him to be in that room where we all rose in standing ovation to applaud his message, and then watched as he was escorted off stage by police officers for his own safety, because he operated with risk at all times. And According to the breaking news coming across my screen earlier this spring, Morris Dees, the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, also had a long history of harassment and predatory behavior towards young women who worked for the organization. And the organization had discriminatory hiring practices in which people of color were discriminated against in hiring and promotion. One of the leading social justice organizations in our country practiced discrimination and protected abusers. I invite you to sit with that. Let that sit in. It happens all the time. And it surprises, even though it shouldn't be surprising, the person who seems so successful to us comes apart and you find out that their success had been constructed on a foundation of lies. The couple whose relationship you had envied announces that they're separating. It comes out that the bold and brave social justice leader was improper. The star athlete was doping. The brilliant, high-performing co-worker was drinking off the clock and increasingly drinking on the clock, too. It happens all the time, and it surprises, even though it shouldn't be surprising. Unless we think this is only about individuals with feet of clay, or only about a few bad apples, we also find out that the school we regarded as such a good school was also rife with discrimination and inequity. The social justice organization turns out to have been shielding abusers. The church that is held to be a model of innovation ignites in a firestorm of destructive conflict. It happens 
all the time, and it surprises even though it shouldn't be surprising. There's an old Unitarian joke. Not particularly funny, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> it goes like this. What's the difference between a Universalist and a Unitarian? The difference is that the Universalist believes God is too good to send anyone to hell, while the Unitarian believes that they are too good to be sent to hell. <laughs> Not that funny. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for your empathetic laughter. But like many jokes, its humor is based on some degree of truth. The truth is this: Unitarian theology, and in fact liberal religious theology, for the past two centuries, has been shaped by a core faith in human goodness and in the capacity and competency of human beings. Ours is a positive theological anthropology, a rose-colored optimism about human possibility, a faith in humanity. This positive assessment of the human condition has its good sides. For example, it has power our insistence on reforming society inspired us to live out a social gospel. But I wonder, I wonder if there also hasn't been a shadow side to this unflappable optimism about human beings. Part of the shadow side is this. It seems to me that if we are so caught up in human goodness, how do we respond? What do we do when we come face to face with our own failures, our own disappointments, our own brokenness? If we're so caught up in human goodness, how do we respond when we mess up? How do we respond when we hurt other people? And if our dominant theology says that human beings are good and capable and competent, how do we respond when we look at our own life and feel like we don't measure up. Friends, our response to this can be many-fold. It can be to hide. It can be to put on a mask to pretend that all is well with our life. For those of us who use social media, it can be to only post happy pictures on social media. It can be to feel a sense of shame when we feel like we don't measure up. It can even result in self-imposed exile from community. Way back early in my ministry, there was someone in the church I was serving who had been active and then sort of dropped away. I ran into him one day while out running errands. I haven't seen you in a while, I said. I miss you. How are you doing? He froze, right there in the grocery store. It turns out that he had been struggling with job loss and all of the stress and pain and uncertainty that goes along with that. He smiled at me and he said, I'll be back at church when I'm back on my feet. be back at church when I'm back on my feet. Does anyone see the problem with that? The problem with a rosy view of the human condition is that we may fail to speak to those of us who are struggling who are not measuring up to some idea of what the bar of success looks like can lead to cycles of shame and inauthenticity. My sermon this morning is inspired by a brand new book of theology by my friend and colleague, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd. 
Reverend McDonald Ladd serves our Unitarian Universalist congregation in Bethesda, Maryland. She's also a weightlifter, which earns her a very special place in my heart. <laughs> and she's got this new book out called After the Good News, Progressive Faith Beyond Optimism. And what she does in this book is to challenge and critique an overly optimistic, positive view of the human condition in liberal religion. She calls not for pessimism. She calls not for a negative or disparaging view of the human condition. Instead, she proposes a way of seeing the human condition that is more balanced, more honest, more vulnerable, less delusional. I don't intend to treat this sermon like a book report, but I do just want to say a couple of things that I really appreciate about the book. Her book begins with her telling the story of her growing up in the shadow of dead utopias. Turns out Nancy grew up in a small town in Indiana, which more than a century earlier had been the location of not one, but two failed utopian experiments. Both utopias were founded by visionaries who inspired to create heaven here on earth, to create a community in which humanity could be perfected. Needless to say, both of these utopias failed spectacularly. And so instead of aspiring to a perfected or perfectible humanity, Reverend McDonald Ladd instead envisions a different way of being, one that is neither wildly optimistic nor dreadfully pessimistic. Her way of being that she advocates for involves being aware of our shortcomings and struggles and choosing in some way to, to own up, to be public about our failings. She calls us as religious people to practice liturgies of lament and rituals of repentance as a way not of beating ourselves, but as a way of reminding ourselves that none of us is perfect. There's a quote by Brian Stevenson, who was the keynote speaker at the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly just a couple of years ago. Stevenson is the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, which works with death row prisoners in the American South. And he related these experiences in this work in his book, Just Mercy, which I know several of us have read. Listen to these words by Brian Stevenson because they strike at the kind of human condition that Nancy McDonald Ladd speaks about. Brian Stevenson says, I do what I do because I am broken too. And the truth is that if you get proximate to suffering, if you change narratives, if you're required to stay hopeful, and if you do uncomfortable things, it will break you. He continues, but I also realize that there is a power in this brokenness. It is the broken among us who can teach us the way compassion works. It is the broken who understand the power of mercy. It is the broken who understand the power of justice. It is the broken that yearn for redemption, and it is the broken who yearn for reconciliation. It is the broken who need to teach us how we love, despite that brokenness. And it is in brokenness that I realize I'm not just fighting for the condemned. I'm fighting for myself as well. In your response to those words, <clears throat> what I hear is what I hear my theologian friends saying, which is that we will never achieve a utopia without brokenness, and in fact, the more we try to deny our brokenness, the worse off we will be. And paradoxically, it's only in admitting our own brokenness that we become whole, and in being honest about facing our flaws that we become, that we become powerful. 
As I stand here this morning, it needs to be acknowledged that there are those in this world who I believe are actively, consciously, and deliberately working for a world that is anathema to everything I believe in. Actively, consciously, and deliberately working for a world that is more racist. Actively, consciously, and deliberately working for a world that is more patriarchal and more sexist. Actively, consciously, and deliberately working for a world that is crueler, more violent, more indifferent, and more heartless. And I do believe it is incumbent on us to resist and oppose and organize against and fight these forces in the world. But I have to tell you, at the same time that I acknowledge that, I have to also say, in some ways, it would be a lot easier if harm and hurt were uniquely perpetrated by those who I regard as the enemies of justice and fairness and inclusion. That is not the case. It would be so much easier if it were, but it is not. I began my sermon this morning by relating the story of sexism and racism in the organizational workings of the Southern Poverty Law Center. What are we supposed to do with that? This week, I've been shaken by the news of a UU church in a neighboring state that is embroiled in a Chernobyl level of conflict. I'm always surprised, but I shouldn't be surprised. As someone who cares deeply about this faith, that troubles me. As someone who cares deeply about justice, stories like those from the Southern Poverty Law Center trouble me. And so perhaps, perhaps these stories lead to a rethinking of the human condition that Nancy McDonald Ladd suggests. Perhaps, perhaps they invite us into a place where we can admit our shortcomings and our vulnerabilities where we can reclaim those practices. Let us not forget that a deep and difficult existential reckoning is important in the work of the church itself. And hopefully that deep and difficult existential reckoning will lead us to places not of perfection, but of vulnerability and authenticity and beloved community. Amen. Thank you for listening to theology, and let us close our service in song. I invite you to sing a favorite one among us, number 1021, Lean on Me, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as you say. Thank <laughs> you.